Well, good evening, everybody. Let's uh, let's get started. Um, great to see you all here. Um, very happy to welcome you to the 2023 Lillian Stone Lecture. I want to begin by acknowledging and paying respects to the custodians of the land we are on today, the Monacan people. So I'm, my name is Tim Beatley. I teach in the Urban and Environmental Planning Department here uh, at the school. Excited that we have with us uh, Martha Williams, Director of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, as our speaker tonight. I'll tell you a little bit more about her in a second. Um, but I wanted to say a little bit about this lecture because it is pretty unique for us. Um, it is a lecture jointly organized um, between the School of Architecture and the School of Law. I'm wondering actually who's here from the School of Law. John Cannon, um, who else? Any other? A handful of folks, but we've, uh, it's really been a wonderful uh, collaboration. And uh, we've, we're approaching actually the, the 10 year anniversary of this, of this lecture. So the endowed lecture was created in, in, in honor of Lillian Stone, uh, who was an important conservation leader in the BLM, Bureau of Land Management uh, in the Interior Department. Uh, many of us um, knew her son, Thatcher Stone, uh, who, who endowed this lecture. And unfortunately, Thatcher, some of you know Thatcher, passed away this past uh, December. Uh, he, he was um, somebody who would, would have been right here. Um, on, he would be asking the first questions, um, <laughs> um, I think. So he was a very proud graduate of UVA. Um, he was a friend of the School of Architecture, so I think he was on our advisory board for a while, did many things, and actually taught at the law school for about 30, 30 something years, taught, at, taught aviation law. So um, we'll make a point of remembering uh, Thatcher uh, uh, today. Um, so let me um, also say a little bit uh, about his mother, Lillian Stone, or Libby, as she was known. Just I know, um, Martha, you're going to talk a little bit about, about her, so I won't say very much. But it's quite a, quite a remarkable um, uh, career that she had. Um, so she was the first woman to graduate from the School of Engineering at Northeastern University in 1946. She went on to pursue an advanced degree in physics at Harvard in the early 1960s. Um, at, at Stone and Webster in Engineering, she participated in the design of safety systems and containment at Three Mile Island, among other nuclear power stations, um, decisions that, that years later would save the East Coast from a disaster similar to Chernobyl when Three Mile Island melted down. Um, from 1975 until her retirement in 2002, she was the branch chief of industrial projects in the Office of Environmental Project Review and the Office of the Secretary of the U.S. Department of Interior. Uh, at Interior, Libby made many decisions that will affect future generations of Americans in the enjoyment of lands administered by the federal government. It was Time Magazine who referred to Libby as an, an obscure government official that interpreted NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, to demand that changes in visibility at the Grand Canyon be addressed as part of the environmental impact of a proposed coal fire electrical station 80 miles upwind from Canyon Village. This interpretation and the resulting uh, Grand Canyon trans visibility study pre preserved the views we still enjoy of the Grand Canyon. So she uh, went on to win uh, uh, um, several awards and uh, uh, garnered some acknowledgement for, for this role that she played, probably not enough. And uh, so it is a, a wonderful transition, I think, to the speaker tonight. And, and before I actually uh, say more about you, Martha, I, I want to just put, a, put the line of other folks who've, who've uh, done this lecture, put a, put a few names uh, there. It is, an, it is really quite an impressive uh, list. I was thinking about this um, today. Sunita Nairan, uh, probably India's uh, leading environmentalist, uh, was one of our um, uh, lecturers. Jane Luchinko, a marine ecologist and administrator at NOAA. Uh, and actually, our, our inaugural speaker in 2014 was, was Catherine Fuller, longtime president of the World Wildlife uh, Fund. So I think we're continuing very much in, this, in the line of this distinguished, this distinguished list of, 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 of speakers with, with our speaker tonight. So a little bit about uh, Director Martha Williams. I'm not going to read the entire bio, but just some, hi <laughs> some highlights. Growing up on a farm in Maryland, Martha Williams gained an appreciation for open lands, waters, wildlife, and people. This passion led her to the wild places of the West and a career spent fostering a love of the outdoors 
and stewarding the protection of natural resources. Uh, on March 8, 2022, Williams was sworn in as the 23rd director of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, I'm going to skip a little bit. Uh, she uh, also served as director of the Montana Department of Fish, Wildlife and Parks from 2017 to 2020. Uh, as state director, she delivered leadership that embraces the diversity of Montana's natural resources and outdoor recreational values. Um, she represented Montana uh, in chairing the Inter Interagency Grizzly Bear Committee and was a member of the Joint Federal State Task Force on Federal Assistance Policy. Uh, she also served a, a term as the vice president of the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife uh, Agencies. And prior to all of that, you were a professor of law uh, at the University of, of, of Montana, the Blewett School of, of Law. Uh, interesting, in addition to teaching fundamental environmental law courses related to public lands and resources, resources, property, climate change, and wildlife, uh, you co-directed the university's land use and natural resources clinic and co-supervised the public land and resources law review and the environmental law uh, group. I'm skipping over your time in the Obama administration, uh, quite uh, distinguished service to get to the the most important uh, part of your bi biographical sketch, which is that you are a UVA graduate. Um, <laughs> I learned today philosophy was your undergraduate major uh, here. Uh, you also have a JD from the University of Montana School of, of Law. So we're just delighted that you're here and able to take time away from what is, I know, a hectic and sometimes controversial and conflict-ridden sort of position. So we're very thankful that you're here. Please help me welcome Director Martha. <laughs> take all of my multiple notes. And... I too, thank you so much. Well, thank you to the university uh, for having me and especially Professor Tim Beatley, who has been incredibly gracious just preparing for coming here, the ethics review to figure out whether I can have a ride to the restaurant tonight. <laughs> Did not pass muster. <laughs> but he's been just incredibly patient and, and gracious to us. Uh, but I also want to thank Thrasher uh, Stone, and I did not know he had passed away, but for endowing, is the sound, sounds like it's coming in and out. It's good. good. For endowing um, this lecture, and I say that because I think I hold um, these types of public discourse in high regard, and I think in today's world, we need it more and more, and I um, plan to talk, I hope, for only half an hour with Matt's help, and then to open it up to questions and answers. And um, do you know, because I used to be a professor, I'm very comfortable calling on people, especially when I see someone starting to doze off or look down to not be called on. So just heads up, um, but I, I, to get that conversation going. So I hope we really have time to do that. But I also wanna thank Lillian Stone Libby Stone, um, because I probably wouldn't be here were it not for someone like Libby. And to realize that she served with capability, with perseverance, with knowledge, with education, and often those unsung heroes, we, we don't hear about them. They get their work done and um, I feel like that's been a model for me. I am ultimately a public servant while I'm in this position as director of the Fish and Wildlife Service. And I also firmly believe in servant leadership. That's not always popular. Um, and I, you know, obviously I can um, preside over some controversial decisions. I still believe the path forward for conservation, for biodiversity, is collaboration, is the ability to work with others and bring more people to the table. So um, we'll talk about that more, but I just wanna thank Lillian Stone. And it may be a little bit presumptuous, but I also see parallels in that she was widowed. She worked as a mom. She um, loved NEPA, which I actually very much believe in the NEPA process and the public process. 
she loved the Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon is an incredibly special place to me too. And I want to say one reason why. I'll never forget on a 21 day trip in the Grand Canyon while I was serving in the Obama administration, I was terrified a helicopter was going to come pick me up and take me back to DC. But I'll never forget the nights on the Grand Canyon. You know, no one's around you but the river. And to see the bats come off the cliffs at night. And just to be able to sit on the beach along the Grand Canyon and watch the bats feeding. So that's going to play into my talk and the value of pollinators and the biodiversity crisis that's facing us. Um, and then one more thing, Lillian Stone, if I understand correctly, wrote a thesis on the um, physics of LSD on the brain. And that fits actually very perfectly into my talk tonight. And that if I understand as therapy for some terminal cancer patients, psilocybin can be used um, to help you know, face, I think, impending death. And one of the comments, or if I understand um, people see connections and see the world in this fuller light than they're able to um, in, in any other way, and it makes them more comfortable with facing death because they see how interconnected everything is. And so if I leave you with a message tonight, I'd like to leave you with a message of how interconnected nature is. And when you pull one thread of nature, you find it connected to so many other pieces. And so that's something that I think Lillian um, contributed to the talk tonight and for us to remember that as we move forward. So with that, I wanna tell a little story and it was just gonna be because I have some really wonderful little people here who know more about uh, pollinators and bugs probably than I do. But I was gonna tell a story about bumblebees and pollination and how incredibly important pollination is to our food security, um, to so many different pieces of our lives. And most people forget about it, yet pollinators are the indicator species and they, we have lost more than 90% of our pollinators in this country. That's bats, uh, birds, moths, ants, uh, bees, etc. cetera. Um, but as I, so I tend to fly across the country a lot and I catch myself sometimes coming and going. Yes, I know the um, flying, that's an issue to talk about how in federal service we are trying to help the environment, yet we fly around a lot. So when I'm on planes, I don't love to do work on planes, but I listen to podcasts voraciously. And last night I listened to a podcast, and this is for all the little kids, and I hope to instill some awe in all of us in this room tonight. So there's new science, I and mean, this is, we are learning as we go. It's extraordinary how little we know about the natural world. And so there are new studies, and I believe it was a young man, an eight-year-old boy, who found his, helped find this new science. And there are these creatures called gall wasps. And it turns out we're just learning that gall wasps literally have manipulated the evolution of oak trees that produce these galls, these growths, that then um, the wasps, their larvae are in these galls, so it protects their larvae. And then they have, have these growths on them that they know entice ants. Without the growths, the ants wouldn't really care. But they have evolved these wasps to have these growths on galls so that the ants pick up the galls, these growths that fall on the ground, that have the larvae in them, take them to their nests that further protect these larvae that then are important beyond. The point being what's groundbreaking in this new science is we are now understand that wasps, gall wasps, have truly not only manipulated the way oak trees have persisted, they also interconnected have manipulated the ants. So wasps have controlled how 
the evolution of these different species. To me, that's the thread that I want to pull out for all of you tonight of how interconnected these processes are, how important species like pollinators are, or these little ants or wasps that maybe most people don't love, but how important they are to our natural systems. So that's my uh, background to try to pull you in and think that the natural world is really incredible. And then to say, good evening. And um, thank you for coming in on a beautiful spring day. Really was not, you didn't have to twist my arm to bring me back to Charlottesville on a spring evening. But so thank you for coming in to the lecture hall for this. I'm curious of the audience, um, how many of you are here say to get some extra credit. Awesome. <laughs> then I hope to deliver on that. And are you in the School of Architecture? Yeah. How many here are in, related to the law school? So a few. Good. You can stump the director at the end with asking me arcane legal questions. Um, how many of you are, how many of you think that you um, love nature? Awesome. How many of you are here because you are friends of Jane Fisher? <laughs> Some family in the audience. And then my dad is here too. So thank you. Not often that I get to speak and have my dad who is um, not a spring chicken, is that fair to say, dad? But brought me to the university to begin with. Um, so so uh, with that, Thank you for having me here. And one of my memories of being at the university, this is so ironic as the professor took us around, was I was here when there was an honor system and I unfailingly, winter or spring, would pick up my exams and go in one of the gardens in the pavilions and take my exams there. Maybe I would have done better if I hadn't been paying attention to the pollinators, but maybe I did better also because I had nature around me and um, you know, felt good while I was taking my exams. But so those were some of my memories. Okay. Um, I want to get into that this is very special to be here is Matt Hugler, who helps write every whenever whenever I speak in public, Matt helps write my speeches. Isn't that embarrassing? Or it's really cool that I actually, somebody does that so I never have to worry about being prepared. But that we try to work symbiotically and understand each other. And this is the first lecture I've been able to give with you here. So it's a delight to have Matt here. Um, a little bit about my background, but I'll try to be brief because the professor covered it. But I do think it's uh, those formative years or I always ask people, parents, what do you think that you did, or any of you growing up, what do you feel like was formative that led you in a certain direction or not? Um, and so I did grow up on a farm, and dad, no, you can't talk more while I'm talking too. I get to call on you for that. You just where that is. Where, oh, I see in Maryland, uh, Northern Maryland, and yeah, I would literally, this is the farm, I would put my books, did you know this dad, on the tractor while I was driving the tractor because I had to work at night or we'd bring in the corn and I would sneak my books on the tractor because in our family, working on the farm <clears throat> was a little more important than the books and the grades, but that came later, I hope. Um, but by growing up in the farm, biodiversity and nature was in a way second nature. And my mom, we would talk about it at night. We would talk about conservation at the dinner table. We grew up trying to know how to identify the plants and the birds and um, know when the Baltimore Oriole was coming in, know uh, how to see the world through bird song and birds and different animals. So, but I didn't stay too long after college and I went west to specifically, though, to study public land law and Indian law at the University of Montana. So once I went there, it was hard to come back full time because I loved the work, um, really, and working with 
drives, which is often forgotten, but it was a very critical piece of her work in the West. And also, um, as the point of this discussion tonight, working with communities. So when I went back to teach at the law school in Montana, and yes, ran the, uh, public, the land use clinic, I tried to develop place-based curriculum for law schools. So for example, we created a semester on the Columbia River um, system so that we had Indian law, water law, public land law, property law, criminal law, all of these different components of working in the Columbia River Basin instead of a class on one spe specific topic. Uh, I don't know how well that went because then I went to be the director in Montana at Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. Now, I may not fully agree with what's happening in Montana right now with some of their, the management of species there. While I was there, we tried very hard to keep a steady hand and pay attention to the people who lived on the land with apex predators like grizzly bears. Um, and then also working with uh, human tolerance and coexistence with wolves. So I do think that that was formative in that I feel that working with the community, knowing the place, and knowing the value of some of the long, long-term working landscapes, um, what they contribute to biodiversity, was an important nuance to have. Um, and then, I was lucky enough, I don't, I feel like I was plucked. <laughs> uh, actually, I was in the car with Jane Fisher when I got the call to then um, be the director of the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And I do feel like I've found my home. It's a much more comfortable place for me. And, and we'll talk about it, but it's because I love the little creatures, the unsung heroes in biodiversity, and I get to work with them much more than I did in Montana before. Okay, quickly move that mat. <laughs> awesome, biodiversity. Okay, so I am um, moving on to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I, uh, my guess is no one, not even me, but I should better than most, understand the depth and breadth of what the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service covers. And I think that it's a lot more than people realize. So I'm gonna run a quick film on the US Fish and Wildlife Service, which gets us into biodiversity. Thank you to the tech people who have said this. Nature sustains and inspires us. Open spaces, wild life, clean air and water. We need these for our health, culture, and economic well-being. Natural systems support all life on Earth. We at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service manage and enhance these wild places. Not only for today, but for generations to come. But our planet is facing new challenges. Habitat loss fragmentation, water scarcity, invasive species, and extreme weather events are only a few. Populations are growing, becoming more urban and less connected to wild places. We must balance the needs of people with the needs of nature. We do this by managing lands not according to man-made boundaries, but by ecosystems. We're using new technologies to help threaten endangered species. We meet these challenges by being nimble, and we're working to help species adapt as well. From restoring threatened and endangered species to working to end wildlife trafficking, protecting large landscapes, 
the Gulf Coast restoration. Helping monarchs and other pollinators to stocking fish. Our refuge lands and waters make up the largest conservation estate of the planet. The plants and animals habitat to flourish and people, a place to unplug and reconnect with nature. We will meet the challenges of today and tomorrow with the help of our partners. From private landowners to state agencies and organizations, we know that conservation isn't a solitary endeavor. Together, we can ensure a future for wildlife and wild places. what everyone else took out of that of what we do at the Fish and Wildlife Service. But um, ultimately, we are charged with working with others. With our mission starts with that, working with others to conserve, protect, enhance, steward our wildlife resources in this country for the benefit of the future generations. So we all have responsibility over threatened and endangered species in the United States, but we also have an international arm where we focus on um, building capacity in other countries and then also in enforcing like the uh, Convention on International Trade of Endangered Species. And then we have law enforcement that focus on trying to shut down illegal wildlife traffic. So there's a, a, a regulatory arm of the Fish and Wildlife Service, but that's very small compared to the breadth of what we cover and try to bring people in and do things collaboratively with the stick there when needed. And I want to say very clearly that I believe in collaborative work and partnerships. We always do have to have that stick there and it is our responsibility. Under the, um, the Endangered Species Act, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, Bald Golden Eagle Protection Act, Marine Mammal Protection Act, CITES Lacey Act. So some of the biggest federal uh, biodiversity laws are our responsibility to implement. So, um, well, what do we do with that? <laughs> and tonight, I think it's for, for, for me to give you my lens of what I'm seeing uh, with biodiversity in this country and to say that I have hope and to uh, posit a path forward for that. So we are at a moment of crisis for biodiversity and the threats are myriad, whether it's habitat, um, ooh, whether it's uh, climate, habitat fragmentation, climate, and um, when we think about climate, it's drought, wildfire, storms, changing weather patterns, changing patterns for species moving on the landscape. Um, keep going, Matt, I think. Habitat fragmentation, and this is I'm talking about bringing people in. But so I, the, my thesis is I I want to express that we are in a moment of crisis, and if we don't act or if we don't pay attention, I believe that um, our species is at a critical inflection point, and we have to have nature for us to survive that we can't exist without nature and these fundamental ecosystem functions operating. So that's the threat we have before us, but I also wanna get into that I think we have hope for kids. And part of, I, we do ask ourselves this in leadership at the Fish and Wildlife Service, are we at a point where we're just rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic? Or do we have hope to continue? And my point to you is absolutely, we do have hope 
to continue that nature is remarkably resilient if we give it a chance. And then I want to um, talk about some examples of where we are seeing shifts and where, where we see investment and efforts really make a difference. But we can't give up. And so that comes to my third point of how do we better bring more people into the equation and explain it's incumbent on us to explain why this matters. Why does nature matter? Why, do wild, why does wildlife matter to every American and frankly across the world? But why does it matter? And then to have more people be part of the solution. I do believe in that people help support that. People support that which they help build. People will step up for those things that they love. And I wonder, I would ask a number of the students, I hope we get to this more, is the way conservation has been built in our country is it hasn't always been uh, inclusive. And there are some places where we've said we're keeping people out for good reason. Some wilderness areas are so important and those wild places are important. So to our communities and if we worked with communities and constituents and had a broader reach to urban areas, I would hope that more people could love nature and then see why it matters and support it going forward. So let me um, give a couple of, of examples. But skipping, I'm trying to go fast to leave room for questions too. So an example, I do get to travel around the country and I'm trying to highlight the work that we do. So last spring I went to Alaska. Um, I got to go see the Arctic Refuge. I flew out to the Aleutian Islands to see um, the Eisenbeck Peninsula, and the Eisenbeck National Wildlife Refuge, Yukon Flats, etc. But right in Anchorage, there is a fish passage project um, where we worked with the community to open up what used to be available to salmon to come back and forth. It was this tiny project, but it worked with the community, it worked with the city, it worked with the state, and salmon returned for the first time in over 100 years. And we are seeing this across the country where you do a very basic fish passage project. The fish will return. And to talk about awe again, like how, how do these species know how to do that where they've not been for 100 years and they come back? And there are, there are more examples of that, but this is one that was incredibly important. And I would add it's incredibly important because salmon are a way of life for those indigenous cultures too, and they're starting to crash. So this is one piece to help them bring them back, but there's more work to be done. Another, I think, really interesting piece of this salmon and the fish passage projects along the Northwest is that cultural component. When I traveled with the secretary, I felt like I saw some of these issues. The secretary of the interior, Deb Holland, who is the first Native American to be in that position. And in traveling with her, I'm going to get goosebumps, I felt like I learned our work, like the indigenous cultures, needs to be durable. We need to be thinking about resilience and the long term. I get frustrated with these short fights, the fights to win or lose that may be in place for only a couple of years. I think we all need to be thinking about the long term like these indigenous cultures do, to think about it in generations and to make sure that these ecosystem functions are repaired or remain in place for generations to come. So another example, it's a little bit closer to here, is the Prime Hook National Wildlife Refuge in Delaware. And um, I've been there a few times now. It's uh, uh, Senator Carper's uh, favorite place to go which gets to discussion later how important it is that well when I travel and I we have refuge staff 
or have staff who say, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? We don't have the resources, the capacity, nobody cares. My response to them is vote, <laughs> vote. We need to let our representatives know that we care about nature and then they can support this work. We can't do it alone. We need that support from Congress. So this is a terrific example where the um, prime hook on the, it's the Delmarva Peninsula, right? Um, had been subject to multiple floods, but say Hurricane Sandy especially. And so there was this um, sea level rise, salt water intrusion on these uh, tidelands and then the wetlands inland. And with the money from Hurricane Sandy, we worked with the Army Corps of Engineers and with the state to come up with what's called a nature-based solution, which I'm sure how many of you have studied nature-based solutions? Most, I think they're, they're what we should be doing everywhere, but they require investment and money and people caring about it. Um, in reworking this and putting the money into the soft infrastructure and allowing the, the original ecosystem functions to happen, there's not been flooding again. It's been resilient. And guess what has come back when that ecosystem function is restored? Roof of red knots, piping plovers, all of these seabirds that go through there that didn't have somewhere to go before. How, again, how do they know to go there and come back to where they hadn't been? Um, and they're remarkable in their, uh, their migrations as well. So how are we on time? Should I work at five minutes? OK. Um, I'll end with this. Those are examples of where we can make a difference. And I think we're doing it um, across the board. I last year got to go to an event where we delisted the snail darter. Who here knows about the snail darter? TBAV Hill. <laughs> the snail darter was like the, the poster case under the Endangered Species Act, really testing out that it has big teeth, that it was it's stuck, and the Supreme Court said it means what it says. Uh, but because of so many people's efforts in reconnecting aquatic resources in the Appalachian area, and I just am bringing this up because of how incredibly biologically rich Virginia is and the Appalachians are. I mean, it's an absolute biodiversity hotspot. We were able to restore the uh, snail darter and they are doing fine. And we need to replicate that elsewhere. But that's an example of um, where species have come back. The value of the Endangered Species Act, which is just turning 50 this year. And so we're really thinking about how we want that to go forward. And I'll leave it with this, and then I hope it comes out in the questions. I propose the path forward where you keep the big stick. We have it. We need it. We also do a much better job of working with partners, with landowners, with urban areas, and bring more people into the fold so they care about nature as much of, as any of us in this room. That's the only way I think we're really going to make a difference is if we bring more people into our, this world. So I'll leave it with that. I want to thank you for being here, and I can't wait to have a conversation, take questions, but I have plenty of questions back for you, too. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much.